Uh, well, uh, look, welcome everybody. Uh, um, we have been having a little difficulty just because our mod moderator didn't show up, so we're kind of scrambling without moderator. So uh, please uh, bear with me. I'm going to take on the responsibility um, and uh, start uh, this discussion. So uh, the topic of uh, closing the global uh, digital divide, and um, I'd like to just start by each uh, of the speakers today on the panel um, first doing, you know, just a brief uh, introduction and, uh, and some high-level comments on uh, their perspective and uh, uh, view on, on, on the issues and, and opportunities that lie around this challenge of the digital global divide. So with that, um, I will uh, uh, start with uh, Lisbeth. Thank you, James. Uh, my name is Lisbeth. I'm the CEO of Volta Capital. And over the last 15 years, um, my, myself and my team have been active in international development and impact investing uh, to promote uh, social and environmental good. Um, what we have noticed and from sort of like taking the lens of low and middle income communities um, and the fact that we've all lived through a global pandemic um, that has definitely impacted and hit uh, emerging markets and developing countries more than others. We have definitely seen that on one hand, um, the digital divide um, has unfortunately uh, been uh, growing over the last 12 months um, and has probably disproportionately affected uh, people in low and middle income communities and disadvantaged people uh, more so than others. Having said that, um, I would say that on the other hand, we have seen, especially at the grassroots level, where programs had a strong component of digitalization um, or operating models, you know, like whether it's NGOs or social enterprises or companies uh, being able to take technology and take digitalization um, and use that to um, enhance um, their offering, their services and therefore also the social and developmental impact that they had. Um, we have a really great example of a program um, that did early childhood development in uh, the slums of uh, a, a city in South Africa, um, where we had used digitalization for the monitoring and evaluation framework. And during the pandemic, uh, because of the technology being available, they were actually able to offer all of the services remote through the same technology. So I think, you know, like where for sure, you know, like there has been, you know, like a setback in um, and, and a, a greater gap in terms of the digital divide. When I think about low and middle income communities and disadvantaged communities, um, there's also been some really nice tokens of hope, I would say. And I'll pass it on maybe to Stephen. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Steve Singer and I'm a partner in Groco. We're a boutique firm located in Silicon Valley. And I'm a lifestyle collaborator and connector, and I work with high net worth families and entrepreneurs to assist them to achieve their lifestyle goals. And our clients are family offices who have net worths and upwards of $600 million. So what I see is uh, all these family offices, um, they're, they're collaborating to look at how to uh, achieve some of the social development goals um, that the UN has kind of achieved. Um, I see that for solving this digital divide problem or this issue is that we need to have these public-private partnerships that kind of come into play where they, they're both actively financing a lot of the solutions on a technology basis. But more importantly, too, in terms of the, because the, I'm on the board of uh, BizWorld, which is like a ed tech nonprofit, um, and how women, um, and, you know, and also uh, on leadership council for women on boards and how women invest. I kind of see that in terms of these public-private partnerships, you, you need to, to see who the audience is or who you're trying to get the funds for. So you have to either, like in the U.S., if you're looking at those particular kind of issues, you're looking at um, how to achieve equal, uh, equality and fairness. So if you're talking to somebody who is in terms of looking at that kind of issue of getting money, that's who you have to address. Or you also have to address the uh, by looking at it from a national competitive issue to say that if you don't finance these things, you're not going to be competitive on a national basis. And also there's some actually, actually some national security risks that are kind of coming on. Um, and once you get through those things of the funding and then coming through the technology, then you have to do the training in the communities. And so 
uh, the training of the communities. You have to have people who are local, who the people who trust each other. And so this is the real big thing in all this stuff is how you get other people to trust you in order to achieve all your goals. So that's kind of what I see it from a 30,000 foot level on this particular issue in order to solve the digital divide. That's great. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, uh, Hassan Arab, please, if you could uh, give us an introduction and uh, some of your initial overview high level uh, perspectives. Sure. Thank you, James. Um, Hassan Arif here. I am the founder CEO of Ab Nectar and also a uh, small boutique uh, uh, menswear firm called Taylor & Bond. Um, our, our, it's been really interesting uh, for us because we've been kind of on the uh, forefront of a lot of, uh, I guess what you could say, closing the digital divide really from the perspective of helping a lot of um, uh, marginalized communities and communities that are just uh, underserved a lot of times with respect to helping them digitally reform, digitally transform their businesses, uh, particularly as it relates to small to medium-sized uh, business owners and then also nonprofit organizations as well uh, to just really help them get uh, up to par with technology, uh, both from an educational standpoint, but also from an, a, a strategic and tactical perspective uh, to really be able to get um, a lot of these folks who typically are not uh, don't have access to a lot of uh, uh, technology, really, just to put it simply, like a lot of bigger firms, whether it's an Amazon, Walmart, etc. But bringing that type of tech to them in an affordable uh, 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 business model to basically help them compete with the larger brands and not be swallowed up or just basically be kicked out of their neighborhoods where they've been operating for. Uh, ages. Additionally, um, with with our uh, interestingly with what we've been doing with our fashion brand is that uh, we actually kind of have a one for one model similar to Tom's shoes. If you're uh, if you've ever heard of them, where you know buy a pair of shoes, they give a pair of shoes to someone. So what we did was we try to come up with something kind of unique as it relates to like men's suiting, and now we're doing women's as well. But basically, we take like your shoulder width let's say it's 18 inches or 19 inches and we convert it to a dollar amount. And we've partnered with an organization called Kiva, uh, which you may have heard of. They do uh, microfinance, microloans. Uh, and we've been picking and selecting specific uh, uh, loans to essentially fund using that, uh, using that conversion per sale that we have to basically fund these little loans and little projects throughout the, um, throughout the globe, really. And we've been, Primarily focused on women, uh, particularly because we've, we've been looking for opportunities to help women who are uh, sort of in a similar field, uh, but also are, are, are looking for advancement in their individual communities. So uh, a lot of grassroots sort of uh, perspective from the, the different types of work that I've been doing. Uh, but, but yes, I, I think... I agree, Stephen. Uh, you know, there certainly needs to be uh, uh, what you were saying earlier, the collaboration between you know the public and private sectors uh, in, in in bringing forth uh, solutions to this type of matter. Uh, uh, because I think it, it has to come from a place of understanding that there is this economic need uh, to stay competitive and to stay to 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 be in, in basically in the forefront of your. Uh, uh, of the global, you know, uh, economic community, I suppose. So, um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, all I wanted to start off with. But thank you so that's much. Great. That's great. Thanks, Hassan. Um, um, the quick introduction on my side is uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, social entrepreneur, um, founded one of the earliest uh, unicorn marketplaces and then wanted to do one that could change the world. And I've been focused for the last 20 years and spent uh, all my money <laughs> on uh, creating uh, uh, a transformational uh, solution for the global economy that basically uh, looks at capacity as the money of the world. So imagine Airbnb, but not for empty rooms in people's homes, but for all of the unused capacity from the poorest farmers, unused farmland to the um, you know, biggest telecom in the world's unsold bandwidth and shipping companies and hotels and so on. So we just create a global marketplace for capacity and we, we create an instrument that ex acts as the medium of exchange. 
And that unlocks capacity as a new asset class and therefore as a new source of credit and therefore as a new source of funding, which has uh, enormous uh, implications for uh, social development and particularly um, in addressing things like uh, exactly this problem of the digital divide. If you look at the digital divide, um, there is this uh, very uh, serious problem that is accelerating uh, because of the financial divide. And this is around infrastructure not being available in many of these markets. And there are many, many uh, rural areas in Africa, for example, that are getting completely left behind. And uh, they were getting left behind already in the financial uh, divide between the north and the south. But now there's this uh, emergence of a digital divide. And the problem it's creating is there's all a high level of awareness of the issue. Uh, for many years, these small communities, poor communities, they weren't aware of how the rest of the world lived. But now they all have access to, uh, you know, phones that they can see videos and they are seeing how the rest of the, and the, the, the president of the World Bank, you know, illuminated this for me as a, a major a problem going forward because all these people uh, is causing unrest. They're not happy. You know, why don't they have opportunity? And a big part of that is, uh, is starting with most fundamental basics of, uh, um, of, of connectivity so you don't get left behind. And um, anyhow, so that's a bit about, uh, you know, we've been looking at it from uh, how do you unlock capacity in poor and emerging countries as a new asset because they all have enormous amounts of capacity. So that's been the angle that, uh, you know, I've been, been looking at this digital divide issue. Um, so, of course, it, the, 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 there, there are a number of trends that are happening. This whole uh, digital economy, if you want to think of it that way, is a, is, a, is a movement of the last 20 years and really intensely of the last 10 years, uh, where companies like Amazon, Alibaba, Airbnb, um, Google, uh, Facebook, these are all marketplaces where buyer and seller or, you know, various constituents meet and greet and, and, and transact and so on. And this is, you know, all the wealth in the world that has been created, or a great deal of the wealth in the world has been created in, in these uh, digital economy platforms. And so the digital economy is, because of COVID, raced ahead. And what we're seeing is, is the digital economy becoming a, a rapidly increasing portion of the, of the global economy. And it's up for grabs. If you start thinking about your IFC's international finance centers, you can quickly off the top of your head say, you know, London, New York, Hong Kong, et, et cetera. But if you start to ask the question, where's the digital uh, economic uh, center of competencies? It doesn't. No, you can't answer the question. I mean, there's bits and pieces of it, of it all over the world. And so this is an emerging uh, movement that existed that I think it represents a great opportunity for all countries and to try and you know help accelerate and then catch up in the digital divide. So I'm going to stop there because I want to uh, I want to get some comments now on uh, some of these topics, particularly things like infrastructure. What can be done? Um, when I, I I was invited to the Broadband Commission, uh, at which they said they have a 50 trillion dollar deficit in funding the infrastructure that's required to reduce digital divide over the next between now and 2050. 50 trillion, not 50 billion, 50 trillion. But no one knows where that money's going to come from. It has to be through innovation. So um, let me flow, flow, flow this one back to, uh, is there anyone um, um, on the panel that might want to tackle? Um, yeah. Michael, uh, sorry, uh, Stephen, would, would you be? Uh, since, since I'm in uh, Silicon Valley, I see a lot of different solutions. I mean, if you look at it, <clears throat> one of Elon Musk's companies, Starlink, right, that's coming on board right now, they're the ones that are developing the public-private partnerships that are funding a lot of the different stuff. Uh, and it's going to be able to, to um, allow some of these, a lot of these remote places to get broadband. Um, the issue is, is that you can't just look at the broadband issue without looking at the security issue. Uh, and, you know, in terms of looking at solution providers, it can't be just like a shotgun approach. You have to have some of these solution providers that are going to be uh, a very um, structured in terms of the way they're looking at it. You know, offering security, they're offering cloud security, the management of the of the networks because you have multiple networks that you have to kind of overcome in terms of these situations. 
And so these are these are kind of some of the things that I see my entrepreneurs and my families that are into the technology field that they're starting to to look at. There there are like one one company called Kajit, okay, K A J E E T. They're one of the ones that are offering this kind of solution, and they're starting to go global on it right now. Um, so they're agnostic in terms of whatever the platforms are or the software or, you know, on what they're doing, but they're offering these kind of solutions. So I think that you, you really have to look at on solving this issue of not just looking at a scattergun approach, but having collaboration between a lot of the different types of uh, um, platforms, Internet, broadband, all these different things so that you can create these solutions. Excellent. That's great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, look, the digital divide, um, I mean, the, the, the digital divide has also created a, you know, a growing a, a, a gender, gender divide. And we're seeing this, uh, uh, you know, emerging problems. What, what, what can be done, um, you know, on behalf of women and girls who are, you know, still being left out and, uh, you know, a fast growing, you know, high, uh, you know, high access to fast growing, high paying jobs and, Inclusion in, 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 in the digital economy, um, Lisbeth. I'm, I, you know, since you are our, our token woman, I'm going to push this one to you if you don't mind. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, James. Um, I'm also, you know, like um, very much an advocate of uh, gender lens and gender inequality, uh, you know, investing in, you know, like gender issues. I'm so very happy to <laughs> to, to take that question. Um, I think it's working on uh, two or three angles. Uh, one is the you know like issue that we were previously discussing, which is in infrastructure and the availability. So part of the reason why um, women and girls are still disproportionately you know like left behind is the access to you know like access to internet, access to you know like connectivity. So addressing some of the infrastructure problems and 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 the ways that Stephen was talking about it, um, but also focusing on you know sort of like last mile models that allow, you know, like the, the inclusion of, of households, you know, like, and, and look at them as consumers. Um, it's sort of like one of the things that, you know, like we shouldn't only be talking about this problem, you know, like thinking about them as being beneficiaries or needy, they're consumers. Um, and actually women represent the majority of consumers on this planet. Um, so, you know, like being able to, you know, like take that perspective, you know, like as organizations or as companies develop solutions, you know, like I think that's one. Um, the second one is around education, um, the disproportional sort of like access to education, you know, like for women and girls. Um, we actually uh, worked with UNICEF um, earlier at the beginning of the pandemic um, on looking at all of the obstacles for adolescent uh, girls and women to go from education to employment. Um, and the issues are, are, are plentiful. Uh, it's not one, it's not two, you know, like we identified sort of like six levers of barriers, if you believe it. And if you just address one of them alone, um, you know, like that's not sufficient. So one, I would encourage people to read that report. Um, but two, I would encourage people to actually put on a lens of saying, can we, can we look at this and invest in education? It goes around, you know, like for boys and girls you know, like in STEM, in technology, in, you know, like digitalization, there is far too few, you know, like especially in continents like Africa, which is sort of like the next frontier where that infrastructure still needs to be laid bare, you will have a hard time finding middle management, you know, like um, well-schooled and well-experienced, you know, like uh, people in the ICT sector, uh, just because, you know, like they're, they're leaping behind. So education there can be a real catalyst um, and what we have noticed is that um, the education finance is mostly done by public sector. Um, again, thinking about public-private partnerships, but mostly you know, like private sector and, and private capital coming in and looking at education. Uh, education, SDG number eight, is the most underfunded SDG mm -hmm. um, across all of them. Um, and so, you know, like I think that there is sort of like a real call for action for people to just look at that, you know, like as something that you could finance with a social angle and with a fair and equitable, you know, like angle. Mm -hmm. um, and then last but not least, gender inequality is not something that is just uh, counting the number of women on a panel like this or, you know, like on a board or um, in your consumer, in your customer base. 
um, it's it's a, it's a mentality. It's a shift of conversation. It's a conversation shift. Um, it's allowing to have this conversation. Um, it's allowing to heart, uh, to ask some hard questions, some questions that might you know like be confrontational, you know, like around why certain things don't happen yet. Like why do VC firms don't fund you know like women entrepreneurs? Um, and it's not about being accusational. It's actually about trying to understand why that is. Um, and then take away some of the mostly unconscious biases um, in selection processes, in conversations, and make people more aware, um, because that's how we create more inclusion and more diversity. Why are the VCs not uh, funding uh, women-led companies? Um, so again, it's probably a layering of barriers, um, starting off with the, you know, like the boys club that started, um, you know, like if you sort of like look back at history, um, I have only been professionally active for 20 years and the first five years of my finance world, I wasn't allowed to go to the men's club. And all of my fellow associates here in London, you know, like would go and have lunch there. Like that's one thing. Um, another thing is, is that when women pitch, like I'm a woman entrepreneur, I pitch differently. Um, when you ask me a question, I might be taken aback because I might think that you might question whether I'm sincere or whether, you know, like I know my stuff. Mm -hmm. As somebody said it to me the other day, you know, like when it, it's just in our like kind of our DNA, you know, like when men think, you know, like that they can do something, they're 20 percent there and the rest, you know, like they'll go for it. Um, women need to be convinced themselves that they're 80 percent there, you know, like before they even start thinking about talking about their idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that on its own, you know, like requires quite some mentoring, but also a shift in mindset. Um, we tend to be more prudent. We tend to be more, you know, like um, self-reflective. Um, we, we are more modest in our projections. So we might not pitch a unicorn. We might say this is a great business model and it's going to give you 10% return for the next three decades. And a venture capitalist would be like, oh, well, that's going to be a way to, you know, like kind of like, uh, you know, investment to make. But actually, it might present a really nice return. So I think there is all those kind of questions. And I'm going to stop rambling now. <laughs> you asked those are I was going to say, I'm in, I'm in Silicon Valley. So I see a, I, you know, a lot of my, um, my clients are venture capitalists. And what you'll see is that there's a disproportionate amount of males on the venture capital side, right, as opposed to females. So you have that particular issue that's kind of coming in. And, and even on the EIRs, the, you know, the – uh, entrepreneurs and residents, they're typically pretty much male. So mm -hmm. what you have to have and what like women, how women invest, what they're trying to do is they're trying to cap, they're trying to say to these big companies and to these pension plans is that, look, we need you to be the force that changes that kind of mindset so that you take your funding in there and they're trying to build 10 billion, 20 billion in terms of, a, of that particular capital, not just like a fund, but people who are going to do that so that they actually invest in women, invest in women run companies. And it's all about teams, right? So if you look at the venture capital, they're looking at the idea, but in reality, in terms of the execution, they're looking at the team. So if they can't see the team and looking at the track record of the, tar the team, they're not going to fund it. They might like the idea, but they're not going to fund the team. So this is like this circle that you kind of go into, and it's more about uh, that kind of issue. And then also when CEOs on the headhunting side are going to be uh, put into these particular roles. So the, the headhunters, when they look at the CEO roles, they're biased also because they want to make sure that they're the board of directors or whatever that are that are there that they get to, they still have their job right so what they're doing is they're saying hey look i want to i want to put somebody in there that i know they'll like so they have a list okay these headhunters have a list and it's like oh i'm just going to only pick these four women i'm going to pick these four women because i know that everybody knows them in terms of the track record so mm -hmm. they're not willing to take the risk to do the extra the other thing which is to to involve more women in terms of this group. So we have to break down a couple of different barriers on the venture capital side, on the headhunting side, to overcome these things. Because we already know that they're, they're going to be successful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hassan, um, look, there are clearly some organizations in the world that are doing a good job. Um, are there some role model 
uh, enterprises that you could uh, think of who are, are actually doing an effective job at helping to close the gap? Yeah, I, I think that um, oddly, as much as you know, people would not like to give uh, an, a company like Facebook credit uh, because they've, they've often been uh, sort of on the um, receiving end of uh, uh, you know different types of critique from you know the election fraud and this and that and the other. Uh, I think Facebook has been actually on the leading forefront of helping to do this exactly. Uh, both from a social perspective, uh, but also from an economic standpoint as well. Um, uh, a lot of people, and actually, I, I'm not sure why they don't promote this themselves a lot, but Facebook has an organization uh, called Internet.org, which literally all they do is is they bring Internet to the world, uh, to places where they currently don't have connectivity, and they they partner with local organizations uh, in, in, with the goal to actually bring uh, internet uh, to those developing uh, countries and nations, so I think that they're they're definitely a um, a role model at various levels, right? Because uh, you have uh, they're, they're playing this infrastructure obviously role in, in actually helping bring the, the the internet from an infrastructural standpoint, but also once they once they've brought the internet to different areas, um, they, they're also helping those. Uh, communities lift up by allowing those small business owners in those communities to be able to get in front of their audience by essentially advertising, right? And and doing so by um, by basically cutting all the the expensive sort of middlemen, if you will, or the expensive channels uh, that traditionally used to be the way you got in front of people, whether it be TV. Uh, other traditional channels or, or mediums like newspapers, ex- magazines, et cetera, et cetera. So what's been really fascinating is that um, even as a small business ourselves, when we started back in 2014, uh, it wasn't until we were able to actually start advertising on Facebook and, and Instagram and, and perhaps Google even, but, but, but primarily I would say Facebook and Instagram. It's been able to get us the, the type of, uh, um, awareness, brand awareness that I don't think that we would have been able to get otherwise. And now we're in a position that we're actually being able to help a lot of small business owners do exactly the same uh, across different you know markets where we're, we, we can, whether it's you're a small law firm, whether it's you're uh, a large organization of some sort. Um, typically, the, the folks that we work with were never able to have access to some of the large, you know, channels that I mentioned earlier, um, and, and now they can because of the fact that Facebook and, and, and Instagram and these types of uh, platforms have democratized advertising, um, which has been really key uh, to to really level the playing field for a lot of these uh, small businesses. So, uh, you know, kudos to them. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hassan. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Uh, we have only about uh, three or four minutes left, so. I'm just going to summarize a couple of takeaways for me, at least. Um, I mean, clearly, connectivity is at the heart of, of the digital divide, and, and, and there needs to be innovation around how we finance that. The gap is enormous, and there needs to be innovation. Uh, one of the important approaches, I think, uh, uh, underscored by uh, Stephen uh, and Lisbeth, is you know, the uh, idea of more uh, PPPs, and, and, and ultimately more uh, collaboration, um, finding a, a way of, 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 of bringing more parties together uh, to do more um, synergistic, uh, catalytic, uh, et cetera. And then uh, keep the gender uh, uh, challenge in mind because it's you know, ever present and it's based on unfortunately long history of bias um, that that you know we are slowly overcoming, but but it still uh, exists. There are uh, some models uh, that, uh, of organizations who are addressing this from the private sector, like the Elon Musk of the world and the celestial uh, type um, solutions to to internet connectivity, and then the work of, of Facebook and others, who are of course self benefits beneficiaries of of of, of this connectivity, uh, but but still. Um, you know, important that, that they're, they're undertaking the work that they are doing because it is helping 
to help address the digital divide. So with that, um, I just wanted to go around and just ask everybody if they had any uh, sort of final uh, minute of closing comments or uh, 30 seconds of closing comments, um, starting with you, Elizabeth. I think given my own my own passion and what we focus on, you know, like for me, it's to, to keep an eye out on education um, and also education around, you know, like uh, digital ICT uh, STEM programs um, or, you know, across the globe, you know, like all around, you know, like I think that all people have been hit in this pandemic about, you know, like uh, educational delays. And it's only going to be more important, you know, like to find the ed tech solutions, you know, like to also, you know, like find uh, all of those uh, kits that, you know, like are a little bit behind, but that can ultimately make fantastic contributions to the tech kits. Um, and um, um, Hassan. Yes, um, I, I think I would just like to piggyback on the, the educational side of this, because what, what the one aspect of this I wanted to touch on, which uh, I think is really important, is just uh, e even in areas where I, I and this is just from, you know, the experience we've had dealing with a lot of uh, folks in, in underserved communities, uh, even where they do have access, it's interesting where they just don't know what they have access to. Uh, there's so many incredible tools out there that a lot of these larger corporations like Google and Facebook, and uh, albeit they might be, of course, like you said, James, beneficiaries of, of what they're doing and, and the connections that they're providing. Uh, there are incredibly powerful tools that actually don't cost anything that allow them to get in front of audiences and, and help themselves close that divide for themselves and then, of course, the generations are after. All right. And uh, thank you, Hassan. Stephen, uh, could you give us some initial or some final closing thoughts? Sure. Two things, uh, you know, on the educational side, I'm seeing a couple different companies. One's Dahlia Empower, who's going out the Hispanic market. Um, that's kind of coming up. You'll see them come up in the next couple of years. And the other one is Entity Academy, which is doing some other stuff for women. These are both women-driven uh, leadership uh, uh, kind of uh, roles that they're, they're, they're looking at on their solutions. Um, but after saying all of that, when we start to look at this, it's all about human to human. We all have to start to create a trust, okay? They have to trust us. They have to trust the solution providers. And this is the biggest takeaway that I kind of see is that we can offer them all the solutions. But until they trust us in order to implement then we, we're never going to solve this particular thing. And this is human upon human interaction that we have to do. And so you have to get people in a local community that are willing to teach, that they trust, that, that are going to take them and guide them to, to uh, do this digital divide and, and empower them to, to go forward. Those are, to me, what I, I see that. And uh, how do you think, uh, what's the most... Uh, a uh, realistic and, 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 and practical way of, of establishing that trust? I think you need to have um, a, um, a, a thing where you have the industry expertise that's coming in with local trusted leaders, okay, and local officials and local people that are going to help them implement these particular solutions. That's where I see it happened, where you got these synergies going on. So local empowerment, um, education, very important part of it, of the picture. Um, look, really uh, outstanding comments. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists, for your uh, contributions. And um, I'm sorry that our, our uh, for whatever reason, our, uh, our moderator didn't make it. But, um, and I'm glad my baby didn't, didn't show up midway. <laughs> Well, thank James. Thank you for taking the, the lead. We really appreciate it. Yes, yeah. thank you, James. Yeah, you did a fantastic job. <laughs> really nice to uh, be on the panel with you all, and uh, delighted that, uh, we had this opportunity. All the best. Good luck. Thank Take you. care. Thank you again. Bye bye. -bye.